Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you bless us. You bless us through trials, which we don't enjoy. You bless us through good things, good times, and family and friends. We give you thanks today. You are our Lord and our King. And your love never fails. Amen. Let's stand and praise the Lord. You stay the same through the ages. Because your love never changes. There may be pain in the night. But joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me because your love never fails. Separate, even if I ran away, cause your love never fails. I know I still make mistakes, you have new mercies for me every day, cause your love never fails. Oh no.
I told you. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, be lifted up, you ancient door, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? them up you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in who is he this king of glory the lord almighty he is the king Lift up your hands, O ye gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Lift up your hands, O ye gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And who is he, this King of glory, the Lord Almighty? He is the King of glory, the King of glory. up your hands, O ye gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Oh, who is he, this King of glory? He's the Lord Almighty. He is the King.
And the people said, amen. 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 So if you could take a moment and greet somebody near you and pass the peace. Tell them welcome to Duck. Peace be with you. to see you. Gosh, yeah. On holiday Sundays, we get to see, you know, some folks we don't get to see every Sunday. Uh, some of you are here because it's your vacation house, and when you have vacation time, you're with us, and that's always good. Some of you are here because you're with family, you know, and we only see you when you're here on sort of a holiday weekend with family, but it's just good to see everybody. Um... This is a fun service, I think. The, all the Sundays in Advent are fun. Um, but I think maybe the first Sunday in Advent is fun in a different way because it's strange. Hmm? Uh, Advent Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, is strange. Have you ever thought about how strange the characters in the Christmas story are. Does that ever cross your mind? I mean, I know we've domesticated them a lot. Um, but if you can sort of strip away uh, the Italian Renaissance painting that has overlaid uh, our imagination of the characters in the Christmas drama, they are very strange people. Every last one of them. And of course, one of the things that makes them so strange is that God has called them to do strange and wonderful things. So I'm going to invite you this Christmas season to sort of go on this journey with us looking at these strange people who do strange things to such wonderful effect. And if you're just here for the Thanksgiving weekend, uh, if you want to, you can follow us, duckchurch.org, <laughs> and click on the worship, and you can follow us as we follow the unfolding of this strange story. Today, we get the strangest of them all, which is the wild-eyed John the Baptist. I can't wait to tell you about him. Meanwhile, it's time for the children's sermon. So, boys and girls, if you'll come up, we'll have a moment together. Come on up. <coughs> there you go. That's good. Yep, yep. Um, today is the first Sunday in Advent. Advent is a church word that means, it comes from Latin. Can you say Latin? Latin. Very good. A lot of words in English come from Latin, and Advent is one of them. It comes from the Latin word to mean come. And so when we talk about Advent, we're talking about the coming of Jesus. And so we're getting ready to celebrate the birthday of Jesus. 
the birthday of Jesus is. Can you guess when the birthday of Jesus is? It's Christmas. That's the birthday of Jesus. And we have four Sundays before Christmas. And so we have to get ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So there are a lot of ways that we're going to be getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. Can you think of a few ways that at your house you all get ready for Christmas? I get ready for Christmas a butterfly, like Tinkerbell. Oh, that's really cool. I yeah. fly like Tinkerbell. My dad picks me up for Christmas. Oh. Now I look like Sneakin as a kitty cat, and I say meow. There you go. How about at your house? You put up a Christmas tree. And you know, I'm thinking that Christmas tree, it's, it's an evergreen tree. It's not one that loses its leaves in the wintertime. It's an evergreen tree. And so that's a sign of eternal life, that Jesus brings us eternal life. Um, can I share with you a piece of candy? Would you like a piece? Hmm? Thanks. You're welcome. See you later. So cute, so cute. Um, it's time to light the Advent wreath. And so if you'll turn in your bulletin to the Advent wreath lighting ceremony, I'm going to ask Fran Thompson to come up. And the way this is going to work is you turn in your bulletin to this page here. I'll read the leader part, and then Fran's going to light the candle and uh, then she's going to say the ending part. Good? good? Yep. All right. Well, it's just all good to be on the same page, right? <laughs> okay. The Sundays of Advent are a time of preparation for the coming of Christ and the celebration of his birth. On the first Sunday in Advent, we light the candle of hope, for the coming of Christ into our lives brings hope. I know. Hope that that thing works. Yeah, that's hope, what Advent's hope about. Hope is, is what we're reading about today. We light this candle as a symbol of hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way to salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. <laughs> there you go. Um, today, one of the things that we're doing, we're celebrating a couple of things today. One of the things that we're doing and celebrating today is that it's the beginning of the week of our hospitality to our homeless neighbors. Um, one of the really cool things about Duck Church is we think a great way to express our love to God is express our love to our neighbors. And this is one of the ways we do that. And um, it's really exciting. You've done a great job of signing up for the different uh, things that we do uh, to take care of these neighbors when they're with us. And uh, they'll, they'll be with us uh, for dinner tonight. And they'll be staying with us this week. So that's a really great thing. We also have a, a video for you today uh, from the trip that we went on to Rwanda in February where we visited uh, the orphans there that we take care of. Um, the people that you'll see in the, in the picture are some of the three uh, communities of orphans that back in February we were hoping that the people of Duck Church would sponsor. And you have done that. Uh, the goal was 200 uh, young people, orphans, and you've exceeded that. I think we're at 207 now, which is, you know, just a wonderful and amazing thing. Um, as you watch this, you're going to see the word hope spoken of a lot. Um, these kids, before you and I get to them, don't have much hope. But once we get to them, their lives become filled with hope. What you're going to see in the video today is they're, they're not really going to be talking about hunger. Uh, hunger is a big deal for these young people. But it's not the only um, 
it's not the only problem that they face. One of the real problems that they face to face is ostracism. Um, orphans there are ostracized. Uh, orphans there are a problem. Usually these orphans are in poor neighborhoods or poor villages, and the orphans uh, are people who, who might somehow or other tip the scales for the families that have just enough food for their own, own families. Also, the orphans are filthy, they smell bad, they may be carrying disease, and so the nice families in the village uh, make it perfectly clear to the orphans that they're not welcome, and if necessary, they will beat them to make them keep a distance. So what happens with the orphans is they're alone, and they're lonely. Um, one of the wonderful things that happens for us when we gather them together uh, through the Zoe ministry is that they're gathered into a community. They're gathered into a community. By the way, they don't live in orphanages. Um, they continue to live wherever they were living. Somebody said, well, aren't these kids homeless? Aren't they orphans? Weirdly, they're orphans, but they're not necessarily homeless. Just imagine, this is a family. Both the mom and the dad have died but they were living in a house to begin with, really a mud hut. So a lot of these orphans have a mud hut to live in. Some of them don't. And if they're homeless and they don't have a mud hut, then we'll build them one. Uh, but when we bring them together, I don't mean we bring them together in an orphanage. They continue to live in their homes, in their mud huts. But they had not had community with other orphans before. Instead, they led a life of loneliness and ostracism, constantly looking ways to get food. Sometimes that involves stealing. But when they're gathered together uh, in the Zoe ministry, they look around in a room where there are 50 other orphans, or if there are several groups together, 150 other orphans and all of a sudden look there are a hundred other people in this room that have the same problem I do about my age facing the same problems I face and they're gathered together in community and in community they're taught how to be clean how to be hygienic how to grow food how to make a small business, and they're taught that God has not forgotten them, but that God loves them. And um, for them to have a family is a wonderful thing. Well, I invite you to watch the video, and then after the video, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. <laughs> We never knew so before, but we yeah, came, came to know them. As you can see, all of them here, uh, the groups, the three groups, they are 56 households. Yeah. Since they met for yeah. Zoe, they believe that they will have hope for the future. Yeah. But they told us about God's plan, a plan to prosper them, not to harm them. That is from the Bible, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. Plan to give you a hope We believe in that promise. We need to trust God because even standing in front of this big number of people, I have never dreamed that I will be in this place. When we come together in a group meeting, discuss about our problems, uh, uh, problems we are facing in our community, child abuse, and other um, uh, disadvantages, and we try to see how can we get out of the
They, they saw that they face same problem, same challenges, and they have compassion to one another. So they support one another because they share the same problem, the same experience, the same life. It's kind of comfort between them. If the ushers will come forward, we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings.
all, I, I, I just have one thing to say to you. COA. COA. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a good school, man. You should, you should consider it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my. The text comes from Mark chapter 1, uh, verses... 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, see, I'm sending you my messenger, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I've baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're thinking about religious fanatics. Yep. Fanatics are a special breed of people, aren't they? You may have had some at your Thanksgiving dinner table. Um, I cannot tell you how many people I spoke to the week before Thanksgiving who said to me, I didn't bring this up, by the way, uh, who said to me, I just hope that we can steer clear of talking about politics at my Thanksgiving dinner table. I had some people who said that they were going to send an email to everybody saying that the subject of politics was off limits at their Thanksgiving dinner table. You know why this is? It's because of fanatics. You know, the kind of people who get kind of wild-eyed and <laughs> oxygenated and carried away when they're talking about something that's really, really deeply important to them, like Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. All of us know people that when they think of Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, they don't see real people who have, I don't know, great talents as well as some drawbacks. No. Instead, this person is the person that absolutely, you know, fill in the blank. Fanatics. Yeah. Nobody wants to be with those people. They can completely miss all the social cues because they're so wrapped up in what they think is so important, they really don't care what you think. Because if you don't think like they think, you're wrong. And you're not just wrong, you're very wrong. Nothing like some fanatics. Yep. And of course, the only thing more interesting than a political fanatic is perhaps a religious fanatic. You may have one or two of those in your family. Most people do. Tricky, isn't it? It's like you try to raise your children so that they'll be Christians, but you really hope you can avoid them swerving off into fanaticism. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. The alternatives are equally frightening. Well, I don't know. Let me tell you a couple of stories uh, about religious fanatics that I've known. And in case you're thinking that you don't know any religious fanatics, I'll just suggest to you that you have one standing in front of you now. Pastor John, good old religious fanatic Pastor John. Yes, I admit it freely. Um, I'll share with you a story about 1987. 
Thanksgiving community service. I lived in Henderson at the time, and the way that church did things was they had a community service, and it rotated uh, among churches in the town of Henderson, and um, it was my turn to preach because I was the new pastor in town, and we were going to have it at, um, I'm going to say, an off-brand church. Um, so... There was a church that just didn't do things quite the way we did things. Like, it was really nice when we got there. They handed us a bulletin, but when I opened the bulletin, there was no liturgy inside of it. It just, I don't know, had a bunch of theological ideas about the meaning of Thanksgiving, but there was no order of worship inside, and I thought that was rather odd. And then the choir stood up to sing the call to worship. I don't think I've ever been frightened by a choir before. But I was frightened by this one. They, they got up and they sang that, and I'll gladly stand up next to you. You know, God bless the USA. I like that song. But they sang it with a wild-eyed fury that I've never witnessed before or since. It made me shrink back a little bit, and I thought, what are these people like? A little strange. But then we got into the liturgy, which, well, if you can call it that, which was, well, it was praise and worship songs. There was a, you know, like a drum and guitars and all that. It was a little bit charismatic-y. Um, and um, I was up on the, on the podium, and they asked me to pray. So I, I went over to the pulpit. There was... Uh, a place for a microphone but it had been removed and so I said let us pray and I prepared to you know give a nice prayer from the 15th century and uh, when I started to pray uh, then the pastor of the church who had the microphone began to pray and I thought oh there's been a mistake I misunderstood so I stopped so he could you know pray but when I stopped he stopped and I thought, oh, well, that's good. You know, he, he remembered he asked me to pray. So I started again. And when I started again, he did. And I thought, you know, we got to work this out. I, am I praying or are you praying, right? I mean, I didn't say that. I'm just sort of thinking that, you know. But, and so I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to stop and let you pray. So, I mean, we waited for, I don't know, several seconds, which seems like a long time in silence with everybody sort of, looking up at you and then I thought he got the message so I started to pray again and he started again I'm like oh I get it I'm gonna pray but you're gonna pray on top of me with a microphone okay we can do that so that's the prayer time and that's that's just fine and and then the music and uh, starts and the pastor and I are on this little bench it's about this wide he is an enormous man Okay, he is an enormous man. Like, I think he kind of usually takes up this whole bench. But now I'm sitting with him on it, and it's wedged into a little place up in the chancel area, and they get to singing, and before you know it, he's got his eyes closed, worshiping God, right? And I'm standing here, he hit me in the face. I'm not even kidding. But he was so entranced that he didn't know he hit me in the face. I'm looking at it, and then I'm realizing, it's like, I got to dodge the hands, right? So that's the way worship is going, right? And I think, these are the craziest, most fanatical people I've ever seen in my life. And I mean, they were working themselves up into a lather. I did something I've never done before in my life. I left the chancel area, and I went to check on my children in the nursery. I thought, if they're acting like this on the chancel, there's no telling what they're doing with my kids in there. I left. I went to the nursery. They were as quiet as little Methodists in there, reading a story. Well, that was good. So I went back to the bedlam, which was that worship service. I tell you what, I did not keep bourbon in my house at that time. But I profoundly wished that I did when I got home from the Thanksgiving worship service that night because my nerves were in really bad shape. One of the most 
unpleasant religious experience of my entire life. Now, I'm sure it worked out great for them. They worshiped the way they worship. But to me, it felt like being with a lot of religious fanatics. Religious fanatics. Everybody wants to avoid those, don't they? If you happen to know a few religious fanatics in the neighborhood, my guess is when you're in the food line parking lot and you see them headed in your direction, you probably pretend like you don't really see them and get into your car and crank it up just as quickly as possible and put it in drive because the last thing you want is the fanatic coming over to you and waxing eloquent and heated about whatever the fanatic is going to be fanatical about that particular day. You know, people don't really like religious fanatics. They make us feel uncomfortable. And a lot of times they make us feel sort of run over, like, I don't know, like, they're right and you're wrong if you don't agree with them. But they don't ever really know whether you agree with them or not because they don't draw breath long enough to find out. Religious fanatics. They make us uncomfortable. John the Baptist is a religious fanatic. Bless his parents' heart. They were such nice people. They were. They were such nice people. They had no idea that John the Baptist was going to turn out to be a religious fanatic. Now, mind you, Zechariah and Elizabeth, I mean, now... They were really religious people and wonderful, nice people. Uh, for instance, they were both descended from Aaron. That is, on both sides of the family, both Zechariah and Elizabeth were descendants of Aaron. You remember who Aaron is. Aaron is Moses' brother. So think all the way back about 1,200 years from the time of Zechariah and Elizabeth, all the way back about 1,200 years from that time, add 2,000 more to it to get to our time, 1,200 years back, they traced their lineage on both sides to Aaron, who was the first priest, the first priest of Israel. And it's a big thing for Jewish people to trace their lineage back to Aaron. And for John the Baptist... Both his mama and his daddy could trace their lineage back to Aaron. Nice people, good background. And of course, Zechariah was a priest. And he wasn't just any old priest. Zechariah was a priest at the temple in Jerusalem. That's a big deal. The temple in Jerusalem, the national cathedral, and he is a priest there? He was so entrusted so highly placed and highly valued that he was allowed to burn incense in there on high holy days and on special occasions. He was somebody. And of course, it was one of those days that he was in the temple burning incense in the Holy of Holies. That's a really big deal. Nobody goes in there. Okay. So he's in the Holy of Holies burning incense, and all of a sudden, the angel Gabriel was there. Can you imagine? Do you ever think about what angels look like? Angels are incredibly powerful beings. Think LeBron James with wings. Okay? That might be a little bit of what the angel Gabriel looks like. And so he's just standing there. Uh, Zechariah is like surprised and afraid. You know, have you ever noticed people are always afraid when LeBron James with wings is in front of them? You know? The first thing they have to say is, don't be afraid, right? <sighs> okay, so speaks to Zechariah. By the way, by this time, Zechariah is kind of an old guy, all right? And his wife, Elizabeth, nice, nice people, no children. In those days, you couldn't go to the UNC fertility clinic and kind of get that worked out if possible. So they have no children. And the angel Gabriel says to Zechariah, I got good news for you. Elizabeth is going to have a baby. And he's going to be a prophet of the Most High. And when he's born, you're going to name him John. Well, Zechariah is tickled to death. 
And he says, how can I know that this is really going to happen? Because again, I told you, they're already old people. You know, he knows that this is not really happening, right? So how do I know that this is going to happen? And the angel's wings probably start fla stop flapping at this point. And he says, do you know who I am? Did your mom or dad ever say, who do you think you're talking to? Well, it was that kind of who do you think you're talking to thing. He says, essentially, in case you don't know it, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I brought you a message from God, and here's the deal. The way you're going to know that this is going to happen is you're not going to be able to utter a word until it does. God is so good. Can we get a course of that going? God is so good. You know, this is such a cool thing that God does for Zechariah because this is one of the most wonderful miracles that can happen to them. He wants to believe it, and yet it's impossible to believe because he knows that his wife has already gone past that age. And yet, the fact that he has this physical manifestation in his body reminds him every day, God sent an angel with a message, and it's going to happen. That's a cool thing. So Elizabeth gets pregnant. Uh, she has the baby, and they're going to name the baby, but Zechariah can't speak. And so all the relatives are gathered around and probably some neighbors too saying, well, what are we going to name the baby? What are we going to name the baby? My guess is that it's Zechariah's mama who says, I think you should name him Zechariah Jr. Who would do that? Who would name a kid Zechariah Jr.? I'll tell you, whoever it is that named the first one Zechariah would do that, right? So I think you should name him Zechariah Jr. And everybody says, yeah, that's probably what we should do. We should name him Jr. And John, you know, Zechariah's trying to go, no, no. And so he's like motioning wildly. And so they bring him a tablet and he writes on the tablet, his name is John. They're like, John? There's nobody in your family named John. His name is John. And at that point, Zechariah is able to speak. So they get this little baby, you know, so cute. And probably for about 10 years, they can project their imagination on what a boy should be onto this little kid. They can dress him any way they want to. You know, they can shape his life any way they want to, and everything is great. And then he gets to be a teenager. Yeah. Now, I don't know if you've got teenager troubles at your house, but if you do, it's nothing in comparison, maybe, with what Zechariah and Elizabeth went through. Bless their hearts. You see, they had such high hopes and expectations for John. Well, they did. You know, it's like they're from such a good family, and, and Zechariah is so highly placed uh, in society and in the temple. My guess is they could just imagine him being high priest or something, right? The robes of the high priest, the authority of the high priest. But instead, he says to his mom and dad when he gets to be old enough that, he doesn't think he's going to be living in Jerusalem anymore. He's not going to live with them at home anymore. And furthermore than that, he's not going to COA. And he's not going to UNC. He believes he will go out and live in the wilderness by himself. And he does. So there goes Zechariah and Elizabeth's precious only son born so late in life to live in the wilderness. Do you know what the wilderness out there looks like? When I think of the wilderness, I think of, I don't know, Dogwood Trail and Southern Shores, you know? So beautiful, a maritime forest. 
or where some of us go hunting for deer this time of year. That's what I think of as the wilderness. That's not the wilderness out around Jerusalem. The wilderness out around Jerusalem, if you want to imagine it, I want you to imagine rolling hills, some mountains. But these rolling hills and mountains are nothing but hard-baked clay. That's all they are, hard-baked clay. No trees, maybe a little vegetation certain times of the year, but as far as the eye can see, it's just hard-baked clay and stones. That's where he lives. So he's living in the wilderness, and I'm telling you, there's no pizzazz pizza to deliver out there, all right? He's living out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. You know what he eats for his dinner, right? Wild honey and locusts. Yeah, that's his diet, wild honey and locusts. I researched this a little bit. It turns out that locusts aren't that bad. If you saute them in butter, they taste a lot like shrimp. Yeah. So, he's living on wild honey. Can you imagine the conversations between Zechariah and Elizabeth? Do you think he's getting enough nutrition? There are no vegetables out there. Anyway, so that's where he lives. Oh, Oh, and you think your teenager dresses in a strange way? It's nothing in comparison with John the Baptist. I want you to imagine a camel dying of natural causes. Well, when this camel dies of natural causes, you can't let the hide and the fur go to waste, and so you take the hide and the fur, you tan it, and you get some leather, and you get this fur thing, kind of like some of you are wearing like a fur thing. Yeah, like you've got this hide of fur. Well, John the Baptist probably cuts a hole in the middle of it and makes kind of a camel hair poncho. Okay, he cuts a couple of strips of the leather. He wraps it around his waist. And so there you get this wild-eyed guy with a beard who's got locust on his breath. And he smells like a dead camel because he's wearing a dead camel hide and he lives in a cave. If you think you have problems with your teenagers, I just want you to remember Zechariah and Elizabeth. Things could be worse. Now, the thing of it is, John the Baptist... is taken by God. That is, his imagination is completely taken with God and the things of God. And the reason he wants to go out and live in the desert is so he can focus on God without having to worry about what he wears or what he eats or what his job is or anything else. He's just alone with God. Sort of a religious fanatic. And then some people come out to the desert to see him. And when they do, he's in touch with God in such a way that they get in touch with God by counseling with him. And then they go back to Jerusalem and they're different and they tell their friends who equally are messed up, you know, maybe you should go out and see John. Really cool guy. Locust breath, but a really cool guy. So all these people start going out to the desert to hear John. And John's preaching and telling them that a new age is coming, an age where... God is breaking into human history through the Christ event. You know, I'm not sure you want a religious fanatic at your Thanksgiving dinner table. But sometimes religious fanatics are the people who are so fully immersed in God that if you let yourself listen to them, you may find God breaking into your life in both the way you most feared and in the way you most hoped. That's what Advent's about. 
God breaking into your life. Be available. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. A child in a manger And lowly and small The weakest of all Unlikeliest hero Wrapped in his mother's shawl Just a child Is this who we've waited for? Cause how many kings Stepped down from their thrones how many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? And how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? Bringing out gifts for the newborn Savior All that we have, whether costly or meek Because we believe And gold for His honor And frankincense for His pleasure And myrrh for the cross He'll suffer if you believe Is this who we wait for? Is this who we wait for? have abandoned their homes how many greats have become the least for me and how many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that is torn all apart how many fathers gave up their sons for me only one did that for me Receive this benediction. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the throne of grace with exceeding joy. Unto the only wise God be honor, glory, dominion, and power. And may the love of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs>